Okay, we are recording. I am Dr. Kim Godwin, and I am an instructional designer in MTSU Online, and we are here today to talk about Creative Commons. So uh, my role today is really to just answer questions in the chat um, and then uh, do some things at the end, mostly, um, to answer questions that y'all have. Um, we are here to support Ms. Baskin in um, her new certificate in Creative Commons. So um, I am excited that there are now three of us on campus that have this. So um, we are well on our way to being masters of the universe. Uh, <laughs> so um, Ms. Baskin, if you would like to go ahead and introduce yourself, sure. uh, we're here for you. Okay. Hello, uh, my name is Janelle Baskin. So I am a librarian over in Walker Library in the user services department. And just a little bit about my background with Creative Commons. So uh, just pretty recently, last in December, I finished the um, Creative Commons certificate uh, for academic librarians. So this was a 10 week uh, program that was pretty intensive with um, different readings and assignments you had to do. So I just finished that up and so the, the final project of that um, whole course was to you got to pick something you wanted to do and I picked to put together a faculty workshop. So I thought that would be a great way to share with others what I have learned from the workshop um, in, in a workshop like this. Um, I know we've done a lot in the past with around the grants for OER and we have um, kind of talked about OER in general, the benefits and how to, to choose those. But we haven't really spent a whole lot of time talking about the specific Creative Commons licenses. So I thought that would be um, a great a great way to start off um, and just kind of examine those together and what because that's something that had confused me in the past. So um, the purpose today is to just kind of give an overview of what the um, CC licenses are, uh, specifically in our context of higher education which can be helpful as, as faculty as you guys are starting to look for um, open educational resources for your courses. And as you uh, maybe want to license something openly of your own. So that's our goal today. Um, and it looks like you guys had some um, varying experiences based on the poll question of um, pretty new in, in Creative Commons um, and some had a basic understanding. So. Um, Kim, do you want to say anything else before I just jump into the rest of the, okay. All right, so any questions you guys feel free to go ahead and put those in the chat. I will probably not see that until the end. Um, my part will probably be about 20 or 30 minutes of uh, presentation. And then we'll uh, let Kim share with you some um, OER resources, places to look for OER. And she's gonna kind of walk you through that. So any questions, go ahead and put those in the chat as I'm talking. Okay, so today we're gonna to talk about uh, just a brief history and overview of what Creative Commons is. We're going to go over the basics of copyright law, public domain, and CC licenses, how to use CC license works, and then at the end, resources for finding OER. Okay, so I thought we would just start with a general definition of what open educational resources are, which I think mostly everyone here already knows what that is, but you'll see different definitions from different places. This is the one from Creative Commons. So they define it as teaching, learning, and research materials that reside either in the public domain or they have been released under an open license that therefore permits their free use and repurposing by others. And that the key there is to, that we're gonna talk about a little bit later is that repurposing um, not only the free use, but to be a true OER, you have to be able to change it up and make change adaptations to it. And we'll get that into that a little bit further. I also wanted to just share what Creative Commons licenses are. So their definition, and this is generally what we call an open license. Generally, those are the Creative Commons licenses. They give everyone a standardized way to grant the public permission to use that creative work under copyright law. So basically it just answers that question of what can I do with this work? And that is from their uh, website there. So a lot of times there's some confusions about what is, um, when, you, when you say open, sometimes people get confused with open equals free and that's not necessarily true. So there's a lot of things out there that are free to access, but that doesn't make them OER. 
So to be OER, it's going to have to be openly licensed to enable what we call the five R's, which are retain, reuse, revise, remix, and redistribute. Okay. Um, other things about that often get confused with OER is what is the difference between OER and open access? So those are two things that overlap that are a little closely related, but there are some key differences to that. So the focus with OER are those teaching and learning materials that you can adapt. Um, it's a broader range of things. So it could be, could be textbooks, not necessarily always a textbook, could be a video, a lesson plan, um, software, things like that. Whereas open access is more focused on scholarly material um, that's usually either in an open access journal or in an institutional repository. So that's just a little bit of those differences. So on to the next part. So why are we even talking about this? I know most of you guys already know the benefits of OER, but just to kind of frame the discussion of why are we um, having this workshop? So first of all, we know it's going to save money for students, right? Um, students that are struggling to pay for college, the cost of course materials are going up. And um, sometimes that can be a big surprise for students when they've budgeted for tuition and housing and food, and then they get to campus and they all of a sudden it dawns on them they have to go get these textbooks, especially I think for those first generation students. So when they haven't budgeted for that or thought about it, it can really be a burden on them at, at that moment, um, which some, oftentimes translates to they don't purchase the textbook at all or they delay it. So they're already at a disadvantage of not having access to that to that material. So that's why it's important. We can OER is one way that we can help with that problem. Obviously, there's other benefits. So besides saving money, it gives that immediate access to class materials. Um, students can engage before the class. They can look it up early and read that material. They can use it during the class. And then after the class is over, they still have access to that material. So it's not something that goes away. They can still retain that copy and, and, and keep a copy for themselves. Uh, another benefit, it also shows that it improves student engagement and student success. So students that are in classes with OER materials are more engaged in those classes. They usually stay in, their, in that class. They don't drop out and they even get better grades. So that's a great thing. And then as far as, as faculty go, there are some instructor benefits. And the top two that, I, that come to mind for me are just the customi customizability factor that you can adapt this material to meet the needs of your course. You can edit it, you can reorder things, remix it with other things. And then also as far as um, diversity and inclusion, it's gonna allow you to include diverse voices in those materials, diverse viewpoints, um, the examples that you give in your, in your uh, textbook. Sometimes those aren't included in commercial textbooks. So that's another benefit. So that's why we're, we're focusing on OER right now. So, I'm from the library. Well, what is the library's role in this? So we want to promote the usage and creation of OER across um, academic programs and curricula. We want to advocate for the adoption of open education practices, and we want to guide faculty in the whole process of OER. So discovering, adopting, adapting, creating, disseminating, and assessing. So there's a long process, and there's a lot of different stages, and we want to help kind of guide you through that if we can in any way that we can help. Okay, so we're gonna jump into now just what is Creative Commons. So if you have no background of what that is, it's kind of threefold, it's kind of three different things in one. So it's an organization, it's also a set of licenses, and it's part of just the global open movement. So I'm gonna talk about each part of that. So the first part, just the general overview history of where Creative Commons came from. So. It's a small nonprofit organization that was founded by uh, Lawrence Lessing and Eric Eldred in 2002. So it's a little over 20 years old. And it was aimed, the aim of it was to resolve the tension between copyright law and then this new ability with the internet to share digital works. Um, it was created in response to a specific copyright act, which was called the Sonny Bono Copyright Term Extension Act. That's a mouthful. 
It's abbreviated CTEA. And that was in 1998. And what that act did was it extended copyright for all works in the United States by an additional 20 years. So Lessig was a Stanford law professor and he disagreed with that. And he believed it was important for things to go into the public domain sooner. So what he did was he joined forces with Eric Eldred, which was a web publisher, and they challenged the constitutionality of this, this CTEA. And it ended up becoming Eldred versus Ashcroft, went all the way to the Supreme Court and they lost, but their partnership um, ended up turning into Creative Commons. So they published their first set of licenses in 2002. Um, so that's kind of the, the background of where this organization came from. All right, so it's also what I, we said, a set of licenses, and that's what we're mostly gonna talk about today. That's what we're gonna kind of be looking closely at. Um, which that's basically a, a set of legal tools so that creators can share their works while they're still retaining their copyright. And then the last part, so it's part of the global open movement that um, advocates for the sharing of knowledge. And the big organization in, in that is called the CC Global Network. Um, and they designate themselves as, quote, a place for everyone interested in working with open movements. So if that's something you're interested in, I would suggest looking that up um, and seeing if you want to be a part of that. Okay. So here are the six licenses, and these are what um, creators can use to share their work under certain conditions while still maintaining their copyright. Um, it's important to note that they work alongside copyright. It does not replace copyright. Okay. So it does not erase your copyright. It just works along with it. So you want to think of it kind of as a shift between under copyright, we use all rights reserved, whereas under uh, the CC licenses, it's some rights reserved. And so you get to choose what you want to allow people to do with your, with your works. And it really just kind of gives a clear standardized way that makes sense to everyone so that we're all on the same page. Okay, so before we kind of jump into the licenses, I just wanted to kind of do a quick overview of copyright. So copyright grants exclusive rights to the creators of a work. So that means you have to have permission if you want to copy it, distribute it, publicly perform it, or adapt it. Now there are different laws depending on what country you're in around copyright, but there is one international agreement called the Berne Convention that kind of details um, some fundamental principles. And in that, it sets a minimum standard for um, author plus 50 years is what is, is set in uh, the Berne Convention. Okay, so what is copyrightable? So you're gonna think of literary or artistic work such as books, songs, plays, paintings, creative works, um, facts or ideas themselves cannot be copyrighted. So it has to be something, it has to be the expression of an idea. And that expression is gonna to have to be in a fixed format. So you've written it down somewhere, you recorded a video, somewhere that's tangible, okay? How do you receive copyright? So it's generally automatic from the moment that that work is created. However, in some countries like in the United States, it's not granted, as I said before, until it's in a tangible medium, until it's fixed. Okay, and it doesn't last forever. In the United States, it lasts for um, the life of the author plus an additional 70 years, which that's still a pretty good long amount of time. Um, it's interesting that in Canada recently, they just changed their laws to match the United States. There it had been uh, 50 years, and uh, now they've tacked on an extra 20 to, to make it the same as in the United States. So that's kind of the standard. Okay, so if, when your copyright runs out, that's gonna lead us into talking about the public domain. Um, works in the public domain are things that are not subject to copyright. Therefore, they're free to copy, adapt, and share. So that's great material to use in an OER. Um, so there's four ways that something can go in the public domain. The first is the copyright has expired, okay? So it's run out. The second is, it was something that was never entitled to copyright in the first place. So maybe like 
what we talked about earlier. It's an idea or a fact, something that you cannot copyright. That's how it's in the public domain. Next, the creator themselves can go ahead and put something in the public domain early before their copyright expires. And then last, there's a group of things that where if a copyright holder has failed to comply with certain formalities to maintain their copyright, um, this is gonna be probably mostly things in the past because as far as I understand, there's no formal requirements right now as to acquire or renew your copyright, but that was not the case previously from my understanding. So things in the past could have had issues with that, okay? So when you're thinking about the public domain, especially in the context of OER, um, you're going to be looking for things that are either in the public domain, like I said, or are openly licensed. Those are the two things you can look for. And uh, we're going to talk later. I'm going to show you some ways that people can mark things that are in the public domain so you'll know um, that, that that's where, where they stand. Okay, so just an overview of there are six licenses that are made up of four elements. And so each of these licenses are gonna have different permissions of how you can use it, adapt it, or share it. Now they all have one thing in common. They all require that you have to give attribution to the creator, okay? So that is a requirement across the board, no matter what license it's under, if it's a CC license, you always have to give attribution to the creator. And I'm gonna show you later on how they suggest that you do that in your own materials, okay? All right, so let's jump into these four elements of a CC license. So the first one is attribution. And that's what we say when we say CC by, it's got this little symbol right here. That's where you must give the author credit. That's the one that they all have. The next one is NC for non-commercial. That means it cannot be used commercially, okay? This little equal sign, ND for no derivatives, that means any adaptation that you make from that, you could not share that with anyone else. And then the last one, the little arrow, share alike, SA, means that if you do make an adaptation, those, those must be shared under the same license, okay? So all of these together, different combinations of these four are what's gonna make up all the different licenses. Okay, so we're gonna go over each one and look at them and we're gonna start with the least restrictive license and end with the most restrictive. So the first one is CC BY. So that means you can use and adapt the work for any purpose. So it could be commercial or non-commercial as long as you give credit to the creator. So this is the most open. It gives you the most um, freedoms to do whatever you want with this as long as you give attribution to the person that created it. This is what they, they recommend that, that they want people to try to license if they can to make things the most open, okay? The next one is CC by SA. So use and adapt this work for any purpose as long as you give credit and your adaptation is shared under the same or a compatible license, okay? So you can still use it, you can still change it, you have to give credit. And then if you're gonna share it, you have to share it under, this, under the same SA license. Okay, as we go on, it's gonna get more complicated with more uh, restrictions. Okay, the next two have this NC um, designation, which stands for non-commercial. So the first one is CC by NC. You can use and adapt your work for non-commercial purposes only as long as you give credit to the creator. And the next one is CC by NCSA, which means use and adapt it for non-commercial purposes only, as long as you give credit to the creator and adaptations are shared under the same or compatible license. So you can see how it gets confusing as you start adding more things on, but once you understand what the symbols are, it, it's really not that complicated. Um, there are a couple things to talk about as far as the non-commercial go. So in the legal code, they define non-commercial purpose as, as this, not primarily intended for or directed towards commercial advantage or monetary compensation. So notice that gives you a little bit of flexibility in there. 
What is the primary intention of the use? Um, so it depends on the use, not the user. So for example, a for-profit company could use something that's, that's licensed this way. Just because they make a profit overall doesn't mean they can't use this. It just means the primary use of it can't be for monetary gain, okay? I hope that makes sense. So um, if you have a question about that, we'll come back to that at the end. Um, so you have to think about when you're thinking about NC, is the use, it depends on the specifics of the situation, whether or not the use is for commercial gain, okay? All right, and then the last two, these are gonna be considered the um, most restrictive and they have that ND designation, which means not, no derivative. Um, the first one is CC by ND. So it, you can use the unadapted work, so you can't change it, you can still use it for any purpose. So it could be commercial, non-commercial, as long as you give credit to the creator. Now, the, the key here is you can adapt it if you want, but only for your personal use. If you make any kind of adaptations, you cannot share that. Okay, now the next one is CC by NC ND. Okay, so it's attribution, non-commercial, no derivative. What does that mean? You can use the unadapted work for non-commercial purposes only, as long as you give credit to the creator. Okay, if you, it, once again, you can adapt it for personal use, but you cannot share any adaptation. Okay, so the key here is, this is why we don't consider these two to be OER, because you cannot share any changes that you make. And what is the whole purpose of OER is sharing things with other people so they can use it. So we kind of steer people away from using these, if at all possible, since it's not very open and it, and it restricts people's use of that material, okay? All right, so those are the six licenses. Now I'm gonna share with you um, two of the public domain tools on the next slide. Okay, so these are not licenses like the others. These are simply icons that Creative Commons made to kind of explain what their status is. So the first one is the CC0 tool, um, allows creators to put their work in the public domain and waive all of their rights. So if, if the person has the copyright for something, they were the creator of that, they can go ahead and mark it as CC0 and show that hey, I put this in the public domain. You're free to do whatever you want with it. I'm waiving all of my, my rights to it, okay? Now, the second one is just a public domain mark. So this means someone else other than the creator has marked this work as being in the public domain just so other people will know that it's in the public domain, okay? So that can be helpful if you're looking for things to use in an OER. Okay, so if you maybe want to license something of your own and you're not sure which license to choose, Creative Commons has a license chooser tool, which I'm just gonna show you real quick and go to this link. So it just kind of walks you through the process by asking you some questions about your work. So the first one is, do you wanna allow adaptations of your work to be shared? And if you have questions about what that means, you can click the little pop-up here, yes, you permit others to copy, distribute, display, and perform the work, as well as make and distribute derivative works based on it. So it explains what each one is there. So let's say, yes, I wanna allow adaptations. The next one is allow commercial use of your work. Do you want people to be able to use it commercially or not? Uh, I don't think so. You might click no here. Now see that your license has changed to non-commercial. That's what that, dollar sign one means. And then um, you can, so as you go through each of those questions, it helps you just walk you through what each piece is and how you wanna do that. Now, if you have a question, it has a little uh, question mark here that explains all the different licenses and what those are. Now, down at the bottom, if you wanna put your license on a web page, it's gonna have that HTML here that you can copy into your um, code to put that on your web page, which is helpful. Otherwise, you would go and just download um, the icons to designate that, okay? So that's helpful if you're confused and you just wanna kind of see um, how you should license something based on those questions. 
All right, so let me go back here. All right. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about, now that we kind of understand what all the different licenses are, how we can actually use works that have that are CC licensed. The two main groups of things that, two main common ways that people use that are called collections or remixes. Each one of those has its own um, licensing considerations that you have to think about. So they, they use the analogy in the Creative Commons certificate of a TV dinner versus a smoothie. And it, it really kind of makes sense after you think about it. So a collection is going to be when you compile different works together, but you're keeping them organized as distinct separate objects. So you're not changing anything about them. You're just grouping them together in a collection. Whereas a remix, you're actually mixing material together from different sources to make, to make something that's totally new. Okay, so up here you see in the TV dinner, everything is still separate. It hasn't been changed, whereas something in a smoothie has been mixed together and looks different now. Okay, so let's talk about a couple examples of, of that. Okay, a collection. So examples, a YouTube playlist. You've grouped different things together. How about a compilation of essays by multiple authors into a book? So you didn't change anything about that essay. You're just grouping them together or a collection of unadapted photos. So those are what you could call a collection. Now, as far as if you want to license something like that, you're only licensing your contribution to that collection. So for example, if you have some introductory notes to that, you're not putting a license on the other works because they already have their own license. You have to give attribution and licensing information for each of those works, okay? So for example, in my one of my projects for the certificate, we had to give an example of a collection. So I went out and found um, some silly cat photos, cats wearing hats. <laughs> and so I grouped them together. They each had their own license. I made a little note about this was um, my collection of cat photos. And this is my license that I'm putting on the collection. But each, I also had to link each one of their licenses, okay? Now, as far as, let's look at remixes. So remixes, an example would be a book translation. So it's a book that you're changing into a different language or a screenplay that's based on a novel or a book chapter. So this is in the context of an OER, a book chapter that blends together multiple educational resources. That is what you can, would consider a remix. So if you're gonna do a remix, you gotta give attribution to each individual work and so there's two things you have to think about. If it's licensed with a no derivative license, then you cannot publicly share that adaptation. If it's a license with a share alike license, then you have to license it with a compatible license. So you also have to use a share alike license. Um, some questions to think about is what really constitutes a true remix? So you, you wanna think about something that has an element of originality that stands on its own. You're gonna to have to make some kind of substantial change to it to consider, consider it a remix. It's not gonna be something minor like you just corrected the spelling or something small like that. If you made a major change to it to make it something totally new, then that's when you would consider it to be a remix. Okay, so we talked about how all of the licenses require that you give attribution. So they suggest using what they call the TASL method, T-A-S-L. So title of the work, you wanna give the author, the source, you're gonna get a hyperlink to the source and you're gonna list the license. So here's an example of how I would do that using this method. If I use this photograph, here's how I would give attribution. So here's the title of the photo, Creative Commons 10th birthday celebration by, and here's a link to the author, and it is licensed under CC BY 2.0, and that linked it to the license. So it's a pretty straightforward, easy way to give attribution and to fulfill that requirement. Okay, so I've linked here, and I'm gonna give you guys um, a link in the chat here when I get done talking to these slides, so you can access all of these links. Um, 
these are the things that I had to make as far as my projects went. So I made a video about what is Creative Commons. I did a, a slide presentation of co about copyright basics. I did an infographic about the anatomy of a CC license. So breaking down the different pieces that we talked about. I went into more detail here about um, using CC licenses as far as um, in collections or remixes. And then this last one I'll show you real quick is a poster I made about um, the differences between open access and, and OER. Let me open this one up. Okay, so one side is about open access, just explaining, giving a definition, what the components are, just a kind of quick highlight in case someone doesn't know what open access is. And then the other side about um, OER with some links to different resources for that. Okay, so all of these will be linked and you guys will have access to this at, here in a few minutes. Okay, so this is what um, Kim is gonna talk about here in a few minutes when I get done. She's gonna show you um, OER Commons and also the Open Textbook Library, which are two great places to go look for an OER. I uh, also wanted to just highlight um, our Pressbooks page. I'm just gonna click on this real quick to show you. So this, if you wanna see what press books we already have, you can go in our catalog. And I was very excited this morning to see that our new open um, access book from the library is available now, Privacy and Safety and Online Learning. So shout out to um, Amy York and Denise Quintel that just edited and finished that. That's just up as of yesterday, I think. And then you can see some of the other books that are in here and, um, it's just neat to look through and see what other people have put together and get ideas of maybe something you can use in a class. Okay, so that's the Pressbooks account. And then we also do ha also have an OER page that has several um, good resources linked for you there. If you click on that and go over and look under OER resources and repositories, let me scroll down a little bit. So under resources, we have things from MTSU online. We have a great um, evaluation checklist as far as uh, what things to look for when you're evaluating an OER. And then also some links to more links about Pressbooks. So um, our Pressbooks account, some handouts, some YouTube videos about using Pressbooks. And then under the repositories, we didn't wanna show you all of these today and, be, and kind of overwhelm you. So that's why we're just gonna pick two but here's some other places to look if you want to go out on your own and try to find some OER. Okay, so that's under uh, mtsu.edu slash OER. Okay, and then two more slides before I give it over to Kim. I just wanted to share um, some of the sources that I used for this presentation today that I thought might be useful. Uh, so this is an article about the impact of OER on student success. So I talked about their studies that have been done to show how students perform better um, when they're in a class that has an OER. So there, there's that if you wanna go check that out. This is the actual textbook that we use for the certificate course that I was in. It is open, it has all the material for you to go read. Um, it is from Pressbooks also. And then you just kind of browse through here and I, I set up our workshop today with the same um, format as what we went through in the course and just kind of picked out the most important things. But, so we, we talked about what is Creative Commons, copyright law, anatomy of a CC license. So if you wanna learn more based on what we talked about today, go and explore this on your own. All that material is there for you. Even if you don't wanna take the course, it's all there for you on your own to, to look at, okay? And then this is another great resource, the OER Starter Kit. Get it to open up here. Uh, this is a great textbook to go uh, as you're thinking about OER and the different processes. And she breaks it down into, let's look under the contents real quick. How to get started, issues with copyright, finding OER, teaching with OER, creating all the different parts of it. She goes into great detail and, and gives some great suggestions about Thing. So that's another great resource to go look at. And then last, I wanted to share, if you decide you want to license something of your own, where, do you, where you can get those icons from. So this is from the Creative Commons page. These are where you can download them. 
onto your own uh, resources. So those are all there for you, the uh, licenses and the icons, okay? And so that's pretty much my part. Um, I just wanted to bring up to the very end, I do have made a survey. Uh, I would love to get your feedback as far as what was helpful today about uh, what we talked about, what your kind of takeaways were. And it's just three short questions. Um, and I'd also like to get some ideas for future workshops of things you're interested in about um, open education. So you don't have to do this right now. And I will put this link in the chat here in a minute. Um, but please, before you leave today, I would really love to get your feedback. Please go take this survey. Okay. All right. So I'm going to stop sharing and let Kim take over to show you some um, repositories. Thank you, Janelle. Great job on that. Uh, That's a lot of information to cover. So thank you for helping us better understand that. Uh, so I just wanted to talk a little bit today about um, some of the ways that we can find OERs, looking at some of our repositories and, and being kind of aware of, of where we find those things. One of those things that she uh, just covered there at the end was how to download the CC images. Um, and there was a conversation in the chat about it too. You can copy and paste, like right click and copy paste, but then you would need to go in and manually add that tassel information. If you go to the CC website and you download them, the um, the information about author and um, title and things like that are actually embedded in the information as part of the text of the image. And then you don't have to do that extra tassel on those because it's embedded. So that's just one kind of quick thing to think about. It takes a minute to download them all, but then you don't have to change it every single time when you embed them, it's already there. Uh, and that's really helpful. And a lot of that is is really important too for um, when we're thinking about accessibility and um, meeting our students' needs. Um, having those alt texts and that information also helps our students that need uh, additional support with viewing of images or resources. So um, I'm going to Share my screen um, here and just kind of talk to you a little bit about some of the, the places to go and ways to find things. Talk amongst yourselves while I figure out how to hit share. There we go. Uh, you know that I use Teams a lot when I can't find share on Zoom. So, um, this is literally just a Google search. This is, the, if you haven't tagged um, where to find Creative Commons information, this is really a great place to just do it. It's search at creativecommons.org. So when you click on that, this awesome open source page comes up and then you can type in anything that you want, um, any topic that you're looking for. This is especially great for um, photos, any kind of images or audio or things like that that are available. Uh, one of the reasons that in, in OER conversations and with Creative Commons conversations that we talk about this a lot is this is a really great way to meet um, accessibility needs um, and, and inclusion needs, equity, uh, equality, diversity, because we can find images and audios and, and different photos and things like that, um, digital materials that you can put in that help better represent our student population. So that we're being very intentional about what we're including in our class so our students see themselves in what, um, in what you are putting into the class. And so that's, that's really important to think about as you're, you're thinking about, um, oh, I wanna put this image in my class that that shows this representation or that talks about whatever this um, topic is, thinking about what those images look like and who we are representing is really key. So um, this is one of the places that we tell you to kind of start. There are a lot of other ones out there um, that you can find. The biggest thing to think about when you're looking for any image is to try to find one that's either public domain, that's CC zero, or one that doesn't have as many restrictions on it. So buy or share alike are okay. Um, in the chat, I mentioned with the uh, no derivatives one that where you run into problems with that is if um, you are having to alter things for translations, uh, or and that includes like other languages, that includes Braille, that includes um, making it so that it can be auto read 
to someone, you can run into some no derivative challenges with that because you are actually altering the content of the work. Um, so just kind of be aware of that as you're thinking about how you're going to address um, some of those things with your students that that need different information and how you're going to publicly present your information. We instinctively kind of, I think, go, I don't want somebody to take my stuff. I don't want them to change my stuff. It's mine and and it's valued. But are we thinking about um, meeting the needs of our student population or end users that may need something? If um, one of the press books that, that MTSU published first, uh, one of the things that we needed to to be aware of that I don't know that we necessarily thought about at first that when it goes out into the public like that for share and use, um, some of the first clicks outside of MTSU that that press book got were actually in Europe and not everybody speaks English. So that means that if there's an, a no derivative that if they want to use our material, they can't because they would need to alter it to make sure that it was in another language. So we do ask that you kind of think about some of that uh, when you're making some of those decisions and and what's going to be best for your content down the road. Um, so this is one of the places to look for images. Does anybody um, have an, an image um, or a topic or something that they'd like for us to do a search on? Um, anything just off the top of your mind? Anybody got anything you want to pop and chat or open up and we can try to see if we can find an image? If not, I got a topic. I mean, we didn't get any of this in Middle Tennessee today. <laughs> we got a little bit of ice. <laughs> uh, but this, I wanted to show you just kind of some of the things that become available when you simply go into the Creative Commons image search uh, and what you might be looking for. So there are photos, there are pieces of art, there are pieces of music, um, there are other audio information available. Um, for you to share with students. And if you look at some of the, at, at any of these, as you kind of mouse over them, and I hope it's big enough to see, I'll make it just a little bit bigger so you can see better. Um, as you mouse over any of these, you can actually see the Creative Commons license embedded in the bottom of each of these images or pieces of music. So this is a CC0, so the person that created this put it into the public domain on their own. Um, this one has the CC, the buy, and the no derivative, so you cannot change this. Um, this one, CC, attribution, you can't use it for commercial use, so you could put that in a textbook uh, that you're using as a, a book in your class that you're sharing with your class, um, but you couldn't go out and put it in something that you're going to sell. Um, and the same with um, a lot of these, this one is the CC, then you give the attribution of who the creator was and then share alike. And the thing about share alike is it just means that the next person also has to give um, attribution to the creator. Um, that's a pretty easy one. If you wanna add beyond just credit me, if you wanna make sure that you continue to be credited into perpetuity, then putting that share alike continues to give you credit throughout all of the derivatives that come from that information. Um, some other things to think about um, as you are looking for um, OERs and information. Um, don't think that you have to always be the creator of information. There's probably stuff out there already. Um, and sometimes what we get a little bit overwhelmed with is where to start. Uh, and one of the best places to start, you can start with MTSU's press book. It's still pretty small. So you may actually want to start with um, the universal press book one that that's the whole all of press books because ours is is still a pretty small catalog. We don't have very much in it as uh, Janelle was showing earlier. It's only got four or five books in it. So we still have a little ways to go on getting ours to the point that we are uh, taking over the world with that. Uh, but it is there and there are opportunities for you to look in there. Some of those you could actually um, make uh, your own clones of those if you wanted to kind of take a look and see how to get started. Um, those are in most of the cases, they are compilations of resources and materials from elsewhere that have Creative Commons licenses that allow them to be 
um, collections and remixes to create new sources. Uh, so if you're kind of confused as to how to start, those are a really great place to look for that. Um, the library have amazing people whose purpose is to help you find OERs. Uh, we also do have the MTSU on um, the MTSU OER steering committee. Uh, we still exist even though the grant ended uh, and we are happy to support you with that. Um, just know that if the first search that you make didn't turn out the resources or the results you were looking for, there are people here that are happy to support you in that. Um, some of the great places to start are with Pressbooks, to start with OpenStax, um, because those are textbooks. Um, but understand with that, that you don't have to be creating a textbook for your course to be an OER course. Um, I can say, for example, in my classes, um, I don't tend to use actual textbooks. Um, I tend to find resources through um, videos or audios or article, academic articles and things like that that are out there available for me to put into the, the course for students. So it's not a, a textbook publication. And I say that if you are thinking about starting using open educational resources and trying to wrap your head around those and wrap your head around Creative Commons, starting with a press book or starting with a textbook is a really big task. So maybe start with a unit in a class uh, or one topic or one resource. Um, I don't know how many of you have written textbooks, but it's not a small adventure. Uh, so really stopping and thinking about what are your needs first? Um, do you have a long term of creating a press book or a textbook? Great, but how can you start to get started? Um, what is the the little bits that you want to know um, to think about some of those things? And I see y'all putting some additional things for us to search in the chat. So we're absolutely going to search a couple of those because why not? Um, I have to do this one because, um, well, Justin put chickens, and I know for a fact that someone that is in this um, session today has a, a slight issue with chickens. So, um, of course, I'm going to put the chickens um, in here. So this is just another one that's, that's fun to look at um, and what's available. So um, pronunciations, there's going to be some... Uh, where you can hear them clucking or um, noises that chickens might make, uh, different types of images. That was gross. We're scaling past that one. Um, I love that some are chickens and some is chicken. Um, so just in case you're hungry or want to know where it comes from. Um, it's really interesting, all of the different things that are available and under those lists. And as you're tagging information and you're um, tagging your images, really also think about that, um, about what other people might have put the tags on it as you're searching, because you may be able to get a greater variance if you have uh, more than one uh, tag that you can look under or more than one topic of interest that you might want to look at. Um, so, yes, um, I see if I chicken. Real um, quick? I'm, I'm, yeah, no, go ahead. The, the thing I keep running into anytime I yeah. start digging into existing OER material is mm -hmm. I'm just not happy with the quality that I find. Um, I'll, okay. I'll give you a, an example. Um, you showed us the uh, the OER comments, and I thought, well, let's let's look for something that might be useful for a class. I teach a finance class, so I typed in bankruptcy. I uh, figure I need to throw in a module on bankruptcy. The OER bankruptcy material is just a link to uscourts.gov. And on uscourts.gov, there are embedded YouTube videos, and the YouTube videos look like they were filmed in the 1990s. And they are, I mean, if you want to take a nap, I, I recommend this material. And so many times when I dig into what's out there, pre-existing OER, it's just terrible. It's just, I mean, I'm sorry, we are college professors, we should make better material than this. A link to uscourts.gov. What, that's the best you can do <laughs> this. I mean, <laughs> it, and, and what I've run into with uh, my online classes in the past is when I link to an external site, everything's running along just fine. Then you wake up one day and you find the external site has revised and the links are all dead and you're 
of course, shell in D2 Weld is now completely trash and you've got to burn a day trying to find new material or a week trying to find new material. So how am I supposed to use OER when, when the quality seems so low? And along with that, you know, the pictures of chickens you've pulled up, they're low resolution. Um, they're, <laughs> they're not good pictures. <laughs> There's a reason these are open access. They're not good. I'm not happy. With well, and some of that, I think it's you, if you put more of those parameters in it, I think that does help um, because you can narrow it down to what it is that you're specifically looking for. Uh, and it won't include all of the other stuff. Uh, but some of it too, the um, creative commons may not be where you want to go for everything. It's a great place to start for images and um, videos and things like that. It's not necessarily where you want to go for all of your content. So this is the the OER Commons. Well, you know, someone uh, got to put some... down on their CV that they contributed to OER Commons by providing a link to uscourts.gov. And it's just like, I'm sorry, that's just lazy. I'm not impressed. It, it Yeah, it is. But here are more OER things. And that some of it is to think about what it is that you're looking for in terms of, of what type of resource are you looking for? Are you looking for um, a a resource that is uh, an article and uh, is OER where you need to go or is open access where you need to go with that, that you use something that's through the library uh, that students have access to. Um, open access isn't a bad thing. It just isn't as open as OER. Um, what about resources that are available in LinkedIn Learning? Because those are available to our students through open access through their student logins. Um, it's really about kind of thinking more in terms of what you're looking for and what type of resource it is. That also does go back to, we need to, as academics, be producing uh, work that's out there for society uh, to better enhance what is available. Uh, if bankruptcy doesn't have some great resources out there, then I would challenge you a little bit to create some of those things that might be beneficial um, to our populations. Um, everybody doesn't need federal bankruptcy law information to understand bankruptcy. They're looking for things that aren't a, on a digestible level. Uh, and, and where are we going to find those? Those are going to be found through things like the OER Commons or Creative Commons um, or through the, um, the Mason, the George Mason uh, online repositories or places like that that can help you find some of those resources to better supplement. It's not, I mean, it's not like you go into everything being like, this is 100%. You have to curate this information the same way when you're choosing a textbook from a publisher or uh, when you're creating those resources out there for that. Does that answer that question? Does that help? Um, and I see, yeah, as Janelle just said, LinkedIn Learning is not OER, it's open access to our students because they can use their MTSU login to get access to the resources. They won't be able to take it with them um, once they leave MTSU uh, unless they pay for the higher level uh, memberships within LinkedIn Learning, uh, but they do have access to it for free within your classes. Uh, the what is that question? How are LinkedIn Learning rights handled? Uh, well, that depends on the on the what the original user put them in there as. It's the same because they're combined within our classes. Um, they fall typically under the education uh, rights because you're not publicly producing them out for the world. What other questions? might y'all have. I don't know if that was necessarily, if I answered any of your previous questions. <laughs> We've got a couple minutes left. Uh, if anybody has any questions, comments, needs. Okay, I am going to go ahead and hit stop recording in case you have questions that you want to ask not on a public notice. So.